Yeah, it's quite a few. Yeah. <coughs> you good? All right. Do you want to shut the door for the I'll go sit in the back there. I'm not sure if you can come in. Respectful. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. My name is Nabil Fahel. I'm the Director of Partnerships and Community here at Terminal. And uh, it's our distinct pleasure to put on these monthly terminal tech talks as a part of a series to kind of showcase world-class speakers uh, for the Canadian ecosystem, the American ecosystem, and the wider world. Um, just wanted to check in and say hello on the live stream to all those people joining us from across Canada, across the US, and around the world. Welcome, everybody. Um, today, we have a real treat for you. Um, Andrew Collins is the co-founder and CEO of Bungalow. Bungalow is the world's fastest growing co-living company, and it's also a residential real estate platform that you'll hear a lot more about shortly. Andrew um, was a founder in residence at the Wharton School of Business, uh, where he did his MBA. Um, he focused his studies on marketing analytics and entrepreneurship. Um, he went on to lead a cross-functional team at Facebook, um, that was in one of their fastest growing ad platform verticals. Um, but it was at Atomic uh, in the Presidio of San Francisco where he conceptualized the idea um, with his co-founders of Bungalow. And so we're really lucky to have Andrew here with us today. And beside Andrew, we have Duncan McDowell. Duncan McDowell is a graduate of the University of Waterloo. And he's also a founder in his own right of a startup that he did prior to joining Bungalow as Director of Engineering. Um, prior to that, Duncan has advised hundreds of entrepreneurs in the Waterloo region and the Toronto region, and today he's leading the product and engineering team for Bungalow with a largely Canadian engineering team. Uh, so <coughs> you guys have all read the, the, the background of the talk, but principally today we'll be focusing on moving at San Francisco speed, building decentralized teams, um, quick iteration and product testing, and working with some of the best technology investors in the world. Um, I believe uh, Keith Raboy is a thought leader in the real estate tech space, he's on Bungalow's board, um, so on and so forth. I hope you guys have your own questions uh, prepared. Uh, we will be trying to take questions from the live stream on Slack. Um, but for now, I'll turn it over to our moderator, Duncan McDowell who will be leading the Fireside Chat. Thank you very much for joining us at Terminal. Thanks for the kind welcome, the bill. So I think we have about like 20 minutes planned for Andrew and I to talk back and forth, and then really would welcome questions from the audience. I love for this to be interactive as much as possible. Um, so to start, I think it's worth discussing what we do and, and talking a bit about the origin story that got us to here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks, guys, so much for having us. Super excited to be here. Um, so origin story, I think, of Bungalow first and then kind of us um, as well as and why we chose a distributed team, you know, I think sort of comes back to my own experience around the resident experience um, and what it looks like to, to rent um, in major metropolitan cities. Um, so I was born and raised in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, in the Midwest, the U.S., uh, went to school on the East Coast, and then joined a fast-growth startup out in Silicon Valley. 
Um, when I first moved out there, I didn't know a soul. And so it took me nine to 12 months to really find my friend group and, you know, kind of hated San Francisco up until that point. Uh, it was terrible. Um, but once I got grounded and got going, made a lot of friends, I, I felt much more established and much more at home. Um, and so the whole reason I moved out there was to join a fast growing bootstrap startup at the time, a company called Medallia, um, which helped brands such as Four Seasons, Nordstrom's, um, Holt Renfrew out here, really think about how to deliver a world-class customer experience, um, both within the brick and mortar, but also carrying that through through Omnichannel. Um, and so fast forward, um, we scaled from a team of about 50 people to about 1,000, went on to raise $250 million from Sequoia Capital. It's the largest check they'd ever written at the time. Um, I rose quickly to lead uh, multiple teams focused on how to really deliver a world-class uh, experience for the retail vertical in particular, um, but really kept coming back down to this idea around community and, and really helping folks on that area. And I saw new members on my team time in, time out, continue to wrestle with the same problem. So um, went to business school to study entrepreneurial management at Wharton, as Nabil said. Uh, and then it was really moving back to San Francisco and going through the process of trying to find an apartment uh, where it all sort of clicked. It, uh, you know, I think I couch surfed for about a month and a half trying to find an apartment. I went to countless different places. It was literally easier to join a venture capital firm than it was to find a damn apartment. Uh, like, that seems broken. Um, so finally found a place, um, but even once I moved in, my rent went up by 80% in the two years I was gone. Uh, it was just astounding. And the experience was terrible. I paid with a paper check. Um, my blinds were broken. My maintenance would never fix anything. And so I just felt like this light bulb watershed moment of, hey, why don't we redefine what you know, residential living and rentals looks like. And this organic way as well through co-living and through the roommate experience to be able to, in an organic offline way, help people find other great individuals to live with and then have this natural community to plug into. And by living with roommates, you can reduce the price of rent uh, from a studio apartment by anywhere from 30 to 50%. It's a pretty extraordinary um, and then really up-leveling that experience. So that was about two and a half years ago. We rapidly iterated on the underlying business model and sort of testing. Uh, started about two years ago officially on Bungalow. And, and have since scaled uh, to be both the fastest growing and now the largest co-living company uh, within North America and I believe globally. Um, so, you know, then as we thought about engineering, the only way in which you can scale and really be able to thoughtfully provide a world-class digital experience is obviously with an unbelievable uh, engineering product org. Uh, and so we were acutely aware of this um, and really started looking for a head of engineering uh, about three to four months in. Um, looked in San Francisco, we had a specific archetype that we were looking for. We were really looking for this person who um, really knew how to scale and build world-class engineering teams. But at the same time, you know, we were a lean, young startup, and we needed someone who could actually dig into the code as well. Uh, and so, I don't know, I think I spent four or five months interviewing in the Bay Area, and it was either someone, I can't tell you how many conversations people would come in for a coffee chat, and I'd be like, okay, how would you scale how would you take a team from four to 16 to 32? And I would get blank stares of, I've never thought about this before. It's like, why the hell are we having this conversation? Um, and so, you know, at the same time, we had grown from a few properties in the Bay Area to, I think about 50 across five different markets. And we had a really distributed team already because you know, the nature of our business uh, our HQ org really sits to help support our local market teams and really the people who are interacting with our customers. And so the light bulb moment for us is, well, why would we can, why does engineering have to be located here in San Francisco as well? So um, we kicked off a search in Kitchener-Waterloo uh, too and 
Um, I think, you know, we were connected in through Liam? Liam. That's right, through Liam. And um, I had known Liam for a little while, and he said, I think I've got your guy. Um, <laughs> and so I got super excited. I had one conversation with Duncan, and it was like very evident from that moment that this was our purple squirrel that we were looking for that could both <laughs> dig in uh, and also, yeah, and also, uh, you know, and has proven to really be able to effectively scale our engineering team very quickly. So, um, you know, with that, we are a team of 20, 20 I think 24. Yeah, something like that. Um, 24 now, um, primarily in Kitchener Waterloo, but also have uh, a team here in this office, and then we have um, one in Toronto, uh, no, Vancouver as well. Yeah. So, yeah, it's been a wild ride so far. Sure has, um, and that has basically been scaling up over the course of the last 18 months. So like five to 10 years ago, VCs in the Valley would have pushed back against having engineering teams outside of the Valley. What do you think changed? A few things. Um, one, first and foremost, sort of the technology that allows for remote work is just dramatically improved. Um, with Zoom video, with Slack, with Confluence and Atlassian and ways in which and GitHub, et cetera. Um, you know, frankly, frankly, it's almost better to have a distributed team in a lot of ways because it forces you to have much better, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, much, much better reliability with your documentation and really force you to make sure that uh, you are sharing the context in a written form and a written record where people can come back to later on and refer to it as well. So I think first and foremost, the technology was a really big component. Um, and then I think the second piece is just a, a realization that the way in which we work um, and then housing affordability and sort of the war for talent has just dramatically shifted the landscape. Um, you know, I think one of the driving reasons why remote work is, I think, or distributed teams in general um, are so helpful is you see a lot of talent leaving the Bay Area because of housing affordability. Um, and it's the whole reason why we exist as an organization is really to try and solve that, but it's just one piece of the pie. And so there's no reason, you know, when you can access world-class talent everywhere why would you limit yourself to just one location because of proximity? And I think the technology is now there to really allow us to be set up for success. Anything else you would add to that? I think it's just that, I mean, you look at University of Waterloo, you look at UT, Gill, and some of these schools, the talent that's coming out of them is very evidently Absolutely. Like, awesome. Yeah. And you don't need to just have kind of Stanford grads going uh, to Bay Area companies. And, it's inevitable, especially with like a lot of the reasons that our company exists, but the same reasons that distributed teams make sense for us. Yep. Right Absolutely. Cool. Have you noticed any difference in speed or urgency between Bay Area companies versus, say, companies here in Canada and the different ecosystems, or even teams here that you've worked with? I'll come at that a little bit differently, um, which is I think there is a push for speed of innovation and success or failure in the Bay Area that is really unlike any other place. Um, there are a couple of reasons for that. I think it's deeply rooted primarily in the capital stack. Uh, investors have incredibly deep pockets in the Bay Area and there is an unfortunate, there is an unfortunate proximity bias around just focus on companies that happen to be right there. And so they get a probably disproportionate amount of attention they otherwise should. Um, but because of that, venture capitalists are also humans as well. And so they have limited bandwidth for them to be able to really dig in on a project or not. And so they would much rather move a lot faster to be able to really see a success or a failure. Um, because then they can really dedicate their time to a lot more successful companies. Now I think, you know, there's, that's a very like myopic view on venture capital, but I think there is a lot of learnings that we can pull out from that as entrepreneurs and operators, which is, you know, how can we push incredibly quickly 
to have minimum vi viable products pushed out to then get feedback on them and see success or failure when you're either adapting a new feature, new product, new business line. Um, and that helps us then refocus our energy on what are the products or features that are going to be able to really move the needle for us um, and really learn from your customer base. Uh, so I think there, I think there is a unique pressure in the Bay Area to be focused on that speed. Um, I think as long as you understand why that is the case, and then you can take and adapt those learnings towards uh, your own sort of needs and use cases, there's some really valuable lessons within that. Um, and I think we've done a really good job at Bungalow taking a lot of those lessons, and I think moving incredibly quickly, and um, you know, Reed Hoffman, I was actually it was at a talk with him yesterday, um, and he was preaching blitz scaling. Um, but there was a core tent of that, which was making sure that you have to have the feedback loops in place. You have to make sure that you have product market fit, um, or otherwise the whole thing will fall apart. Uh, and so I think that's the big piece is it's critical you have those feedback loops. I think so many times uh, around here at the companies that I've worked with in the past, there is a certain reticence to not failing fast and, and there's almost like a shame about failing that I think needs to be much more embraced as like you're learning. And totally. You're growing. Yeah. You're only going to get better. And just a bit of a conservative mindset. Well, so what's interesting is um, and we've started to preach this more as we onboard new members onto our team and new employees. Uh, in big companies, in big company cultures, you are taught the number one thing that you should do is avoid a mistake um, because that's how you get fired. Uh, in a startup, that is how you get fired. Uh, that is horrible. Like if we're running full speed ahead, you're going to stub your toe and failure should be embraced because that's how you learn and you're not pushing the envelope fast enough or hard enough if you don't fail. So, well, uh, and a person that makes a mistake is and it's a, if it's a serious mistake, they're probably not going to make that mistake again. So exactly. firing them is almost like you're, you're losing the value that you got from them learning. Totally. Well, and like, let's have a on what were the inputs for that decision making. And if we can agree on the right process for the decision making framework and the inputs were correct and there was an extraneous factor that we didn't see, let's figure out what that was so we avoid it next time. But... Like, I would much rather we move quickly and stub our toe than the opposite. 100%. And we certainly have many <laughs> yeah. times, yeah. but we've learned from it. Yeah. So. Uh, bring it back to distributed teams a bit. Uh, I often say that we move at the speed of trust, and I'm curious what that means to you. Um, I think you can say this much more profoundly than I can, so I'm going to flip this to you <laughs> after I say my bit. Um, you know, I think... I think that in distributed teams in particular, even more so than when you're all co-located, the alignment on culture and values and decision-making frameworks that you have in this organization is so unbelievably important because you literally will not be in the room with that person when it's being made. And it's incredibly important that you have alignment across every individual and across every org. Um, that we have the same common value set and knowledge of what we're building towards. So mission, vision, culture, values. Uh, and then like, it's just with distributed teams, there needs to be probably a little bit more overlap. Um, so we have majority of our product team based in the Bay Area, obviously engineering based in Canada, distributed. Um, I think that probably has aligned towards Inch here does a lot more product work um, and that's, I think, a great thing. Totally. So. Yeah, I mean, for me on, on my team, it's, it's very much, like you mentioned, somebody might not be in the room, somebody might not be available. If, if we need to make a hard decision on something in order to move quickly, we need to know that the other side is going to trust that the decision we're making is correct and, yep. and the right option. And so uh, if we're waiting, we're not moving. And we need to fundamentally be trusting each other so that we can each move very quickly, especially when you have time zones separating us. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So you, you mentioned culture. Um, this is a really interesting one for me. It's something that I deeply care about. I think 
uh, Albert, who was the first person that, that I hired, uh, the first meeting that we had was sitting down together and, and talking about the values that we cared about from, from an engineering-centric perspective. Yep. Bungalow very much already had mission, vision, values, as you yep. expect. But uh, for us, it was, it was a situation of what do we want to do with our team? How do we want to think about hiring generally? And, and what kind of people do we want to fill the room with? And so very interesting in that Bungalow already had an existing culture. And so curious from your perspective, how much are we trying to create a one-to-one -one culture versus how much are we trying to allow culture to grow organically from the people in the room? Yeah, I think coming back to the previous point, it's really important that we have alignment around the vision and mission and high level, like a lot of shared values, right? Like we need to ensure that it's one, that's super corny and I can't believe I'm gonna say it, one team, one dream. Um, and it, that alignment helps drive the culture of trust, right? Um, but that said, you know, each organization, department, and I think location is obviously gonna develop their own culture and value set and norms. Um, and I think as long as there is a large Venn diagram of swaths, like those should be celebrated. Um, because that's, that's what makes it special, right? Yeah. yeah, I mean, if you look at the values that we talked about and you look at the values that are on like very much the HQ side from when we uh, started, it's like there are, if they're not one-to-one, -one, they're touching, they're adjacent yes. to each other yes. in a very meaningful way, so. Yeah, but I think what you've done a phenomenal job and the team has done a phenomenal job is taking, absorbing sort of what and aligning on what those values are and then pulling out, okay, how do we adapt those slightly to what does that mean for us? Think again, distributed. Uh, about product engineering a lot of time, you have this concept of uh, things coming over the fence to engineering in, in a poorly run situation. Uh, we don't have that. So how do you think about uh, not having a list of to-dos but instead having collaboration? Yeah, I think, you know, especially in this day and age, that's one thing that can be really, really challenging. Um, and so, obviously, a, a big component of this is how we structure the organization and how we think about sort of the business, the business rhythm. And so what I mean by the business rhythm is not only is sort of like what is the department structure that we've created, and then over communication just in general is incredibly important for distributed teams. And so then thinking through, okay, what are, what are the regular cadence of meetings and how do we over communicate so that we have alignment and collaboration um, on what it is that we're trying to build. And so we've structured the team where we have sort of a core executive team. Um, two of those folks, Duncan included, are typically remote. Um, so obviously video, by the way, incredibly important. Audio, phone calls, don't do anything. You really can't like build trust without being able to see the other person. Um, it's so important, especially when giving or receiving feedback or trying to collaborate. Um, visual cues are unbelievably important. So like Zoom is great. Uh, there's a reason why it's done so well. Uh, <laughs> and so then, so we think about it as exact team, then we have a senior leadership team um, which has a broader group of the engineering org uh, as a part of it to help us sort of work through, you know, what are the key drivers that we're focused on? What are the blockers that other teams can help align with? Um, and then aligning on areas where they need help cross-functionally. And so then we're a team of uh, 85 today. Uh, so for us, we still are small where we really need to have uh, departments, so your standard eng, marketing, product, uh, design orgs, so that you can have professional and personal development within those orgs. But then the problems that we focus on are so unbelievably cross-functional that it's really important that we then have a different sort of <laughs> measure or meeting structure where we can align and get those stakeholders cross-functionally in the room. So in addition to those different departments, we then have I think generally five to six cross-functional pods that are working on sort of what are the biggest uh, initiatives that we have for a given quarter or two quarters. So that's an amazing opportunity, again, getting back to that collaboration away from a to-do list 
to have engineering and the distributed team represented um, by at least one or two stakeholders within each one of those meetings. So then you have uh, that business context directly from the front line, as well as the engineering context around, okay, how do we think we'll actually develop this in the real world? Um, and I think it makes for a much more collaborative organization, um, the to-do list in JIRA. Totally. We happen to have a situation where the engineering team is actually taking a lot of product work on early, and I think yep. it actually is hugely important for us now that we have a, a wonderful product team now, but you have a group of engineers that really care about product, and they want to get involved early, they want to be in the decision-making process, and I think we make better decisions that way. Yep, absolutely. Um, and I also think we've seen a pretty, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, I think we've seen much better results. So, like, we obviously didn't just invent pods out of nowhere. Um, so this was through a lot of iteration, uh, and I think we found the the pod structure because of that business owner slash developer collaboration has allowed us to really accelerate our velocity as well. As um, there's been a lot less ambiguity within the development cycle. So. Last question I have for you, please. We were able to find product market fit pretty quickly mm -hmm. as a company. Do you have any lessons from that path that could help other startups that are listening? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think iterate early and often. Um, iterate before you even have a product. Uh, we did a ton of consumer research, market research. We did a lot of testing different distribution sites. Um, with very little capital, you can spin up a really cheap Squarespace web page, landing page, or whatever, uh, and then throw some money on Facebook and Google Ads and see if you have something there. Uh, and so we were actually able to iterate on the framing, iterate on the product offering, iterate on um, the sort of price point before we even ever had product. Um, and I think that allowed us to have a lot of unlocks and learnings before spending a dime, really. Uh, and so that accelerated product market fit so much more quickly than I think if we just started cold and, and hoped for the best. Um, what about you? From, from, the, from the flip side, um, I mean, I think, I think neither one of us probably would have dreamed how quickly we've moved and accelerated sort of the hiring here. Mm -hmm. um, what have been your, what have been your biggest surprises? And then like any words of wisdoms for, for others thinking about sort of distributed teams? Sure, yeah. So I think that I'm actually surprised at how successful we've been at growing the team so quickly in not just in Kishwaterloo, but Toronto, Vancouver as well. The terminal model has actually been quite helpful there, especially the recruiting help that we've had. But one thing that, that sticks out to me that has been super helpful is that we've had so many referrals internally from the team that have allowed us to grow, not just the quantity, but like the quality of the team is, is significant. And yep. I think using that as a measurement for health of an organization, the number of referrals that you're getting internally and, and the number of people that you're, you're seeing that come from the people that you already have that say, hey, I, I love this work environment, you should come, you should come join. And I think we've like 60%, something like that, Wow, uh, which is, is huge and, and like a testament to, I think, uh, how this model works. Yep. And as far as like learnings or, or things that I've, I've been able to uh, enjoy, I think that I anticipated that it was going to be harder to have communication work tight loops between HQ and, mm -hmm. and here. And I think one of the fundamental things that we've done to, to make that work well is, is that we trust each other and that we are candid. Yep. And bringing it back to the values that we've discussed, those are the two of the key ones that, that we discussed early on and it's like, you can't do this without it. Yep. And you can't move fast without it. Yeah, I think those are two really big points. Um, we, from the very beginning, talked a lot about you will, my promise to you is you will always know 
where you stand with me and vice versa. Yeah. Um, and you know, again, getting back to that kind of culture of feedback, it's so important. And this is why video is also really important is those hard conversations. Um, it can still be done virtually. Thank goodness with the video conference. Also, thank goodness those difficult conversations were few and far between. Um, but I, I think that that candor and trust is a core element. And then I think the last piece is there is truly uh, nothing like face to face in person. And so I think we also do a really good job of with some some frequent cadence, yep. making sure that that we're doing something like this and, and meeting in person. So. Well, I think time to open it up to the questions. Please. Yes. So tell me a bit more about your strategy, your mission, vision, and, and has that evolved over time? I imagine it was quite different when you were very small. Tell, tell a bit about that and what you've learned. Yeah, yes and no. Um, I think obviously we've iterated a ton on the feature set and the little pieces of the business model. Um, you know, our vision is to give everyone a place to call home. And for us, home is an umbrella of not just the physical space, not just the digital space, but also the community of people that you then live with um, and then are plugged into from the market. And so obviously that's a very broad vision statement. And so there's a lot of pieces within that. Um, within the co-living space, there are a lot of folks that had come up through ground up new developments. and so building specific projects, it's really capital intensive, it's really expensive, it's hard to scale, it takes a long time. Um, and I think they have a lot more kind of big shared spaces, which feel like hotel lobbies, no one really likes. I can go on for a whole tangent on this for a long time, so I'll stop. Um, for us, you know, our core thesis was, as there's an aging population um, of folks who will potentially want to downsize um, and as average family size has shrunk, you actually have these larger properties of existing inventory that's kind of hard to rent and are not, as families have moved out of those bedrooms, are no longer efficiently being utilized from a space capacity um, either. And so we felt very confident that we could create a marketplace first and foremost of using that existing inventory of homes as opposed to or multifamily apartment buildings to help bring people together and build this sort of amazing home experience within that. Um, that hasn't changed. And I think if anything, we've become even, had even greater conviction that that was the right strategy. Um, now, the pieces, like there's a lot of different things. We used to think that on property management of like if a toilet was broken or housekeeping or a lot of like these little little things that homeowners would sort of do it for us. That's not the case, and we're spinning out new business models um, to be able to handle that. Um, we always thought sort of a business gating of the business model that we're doing today will not be the business model that we'll do in three to five years. It's actually kind of crazy going back to the deck that I put together for this angel round. We are almost exactly on target for the five-year plan of how we iterate on these things. Um, so a lot of little things have changed. We've learned a ton. Pricing has changed. Uh, I used to pick all the furniture. It was garbage. We now have someone who does way better than I do. Um, so those feedback loops and improvements are there. But honestly, we've, we've stayed pretty true to what the, the vision has been from day one. So. Yes? You touched a little bit on Um, Craigslist. So think about where your demand is, right? Uh, I think it's a huge component. So for us, we're not reinventing the wheel. The, the thing that we are providing at the very, very beginning was a home and sort of roommates. And so, you know, we we're trying to displace a room share on Craigslist. So if people are going to look for a room share on Craigslist, why don't we go where they're looking for that room share on Craigslist? And then they'll be wowed by this differentiated approach towards it. Uh, and so in a very similar way that Airbnb in the early days was able to hack on top of Craigslist, we did the same. Um, I am very glad to say that Craigslist used to be like 80% of our leases. 
Um, it is now like less than 10% of our lease volume. Um, so you can hack your way through a lot of different things, but then over time, think about distribution channels so you're not overly reliant on, uh, on one. So. so right now, like on the distribution side, like is it purely just online or? Um, it, it is currently purely online. Uh, organic word of mouth is our number one source. I think for us, we're still a Series A company. Um, I'm not going out buying billboards right now. Uh, but I do think an offline integrated marketing approach will make sense at some point. Um, but you have to be thoughtful around what is the right approach, what is the right strategy for you, and what do you expect on a, a DR versus a, a brand buy. So, yeah. But I think the biggest one is like, don't fight, don't fight looking for a demand. Go to where if you are putting yourself in your customer's shoes, where would you go? Um, where would you look for you? And try and meet them there. Yeah. What are some of the problems that you know you need to solve, or problems <laughs> that you want to solve that you haven't figured out how to solve? There's so many. <laughs> um, there are so many. We just had a prioritization conversation like 30 minutes before we got over here. Uh, there's also like a lot of things that you want. Yeah, there's a lot of things that you want to do that is just not the burning fire. Um, and so what is the fire that is most important to focus on with limited hours in the day? I think the number one that we're about to focus on um, was actually what I alluded to a second ago, which is on this cleaning and maintenance. Um, you know, for us there, we've been using sort of third party contractors to do a lot of this. Um, Duncan and the team have done a phenomenal job in the last month and a half rolling out our uh, member app, which will really help. It has really helped already improve um, the maintenance experience substantially. But then the next piece is we're a digital and then on the ground ops company. And the on the ground ops by using third party people is just like not delivering the experience that we need. Uh, and so there's an opportunity for us to reduce costs, potentially flip to a profit center, and deliver a better customer experience. Um, and so sort of thinking about, for us, what's gonna do the best thing for the customer, and then thinking about, okay, how do we make this underlying unit economics um, work for the business as well? And so I think generally, it's like those areas, efficiency, and then alignment back towards that broad vision of goal um, is how we sort of decide how to prioritize through. So, sometimes you have to let fires burn. Yeah, you, you do. Um, as much as it hurts, it it, it does sometimes. <laughs> but I think it's it's really important that you have a strong framework for how you think about and choose which ones to do. And, and candidly, it's something I really struggle with. Um, we have a ton of concurrency right now. Probably my fault. Um, that's all important. <laughs> <laughs> I accept little, it. Little I, bit. I mean, I allow it to happen, so yeah. Can't just um, you. <laughs> but it's it's hard, uh, and we we just shifted we just shifted one of our top priorities, um, and that was a really hard conversation. Um, but I think ultimately we because of that framework of what's going to have the biggest impact on our customer. Um, what is right both from a short-term and a long-term perspective, uh, and then also thinking about, okay, what's, what does make sense from a financial standpoint? Um, it made sense that what we were focusing on was actually probably not the top priority. And that doesn't mean that we're not doing that other thing, we're just shifting it back. So, yeah. Uh, what's your, your market demographic as far as big cities, big cities where the rent prices are very high, ages that you're sort of dealing with and where you would like to penetrate more? Yeah, um, so we, you know, so our target demographic, first and foremost, it started out of my own empathy for the resident experience. So big surprise, um, we are sort of going after that millennial Gen Z demo first and foremost. Um, it's the largest population. Um, it's a cute need that we feel. Um, it is by no means where we're stopping. It's just where we're focused on right now. 
So our median age of our renter is 27 and a half. Um, there's variability anywhere from 20 to mid 40s. Um, you know, I think, and, and then we focused on sort of uh, cities where affordability is a big issue. And so we have a whole probably 15 point launch playbook that goes through how we evaluate criteria of different cities. Um, and so we've we moved really quickly to launch 10 markets. Uh, we will be launching another international market somewhere in soon. Canada soon, which we're <laughs> excited by, um, which will be awesome. Uh, but I think for us now, the main priority is how do we go deeper and, and grow market share within our existing markets before we go and launch a lot wider. I think for us, we really felt confident we developed that launch playbook and we feel really good about it. And so now it's, okay, how do we move from doing two or three or four new properties per month um, to doing 20? In the market and I think that's a bigger problem for us to solve right now so and that unlocks a better customer experience it unlocks better network effects it unlocks um, economies of scale and so there are a lot of things by forcing ourselves into this uncomfortable sort of blitz scale within markets that I think will learn it will accelerate our speed of learning um, more so than continuing to go wide so do you have any covert um, methods to determine the compatibility of code habits? Like, um, so I've developed subtle psychological tests to say, okay, these people like this movie, therefore they live well together. That's it's one of the things Duncan's team is working on right now, to be honest. Um, sure. So we engaged with a Harvard behavioral psychologist in the very early days. Um, you know, I think they're. It's interesting that the top university algorithmic only matching for roommates had a 55% success rating. It's absolute <laughs> garbage. Um, but as soon as that you. Was 100%, so huh? sell to you. <laughs> um, as soon as you introduce choice into it, it jumps to 90%. Um, and so for us, it's really about uh, how do we do. We'll do background checks, credit checks, reference checks, um, qualitative interviews. Uh, we're in the process of doing matching and personality testing as well, uh, and then over time, do machine learning on that. Um, but then that's really just to help put the right people in front of the residents who are already living there, and ultimately it's their choice of who they want to live with. Um, and so that is, I think, frankly a lot better, is I'd want to choose who I want to live with, obviously, um, from a human decency standpoint, but also uh, I think, enables probably a lot better sense of buy-in and compatibility. Um, so, it makes a ton of sense. And back. So, how, how are you balancing the profitability with growth? Since we hear a lot about new work, including food IPO, what's your model? Yeah, I think it's incredibly, well, it's a very complicated question. I think it depends on a few things. Um, you know, one, like for you, you need to figure out what does the competitive landscape look like? Are there low barriers to entry or high barriers to entry? Uh, and then are there competitors coming after you? And so for us, co-living is a pretty nascent space, but there are a handful of competitors in there. And so, and I think one of the ways in which we really develop a moat is through escape velocity of going really quickly. And so that does push you towards growth um, and it has pushed us towards growth. Um, you know, also the makeup of our team just in general um, is we all come from high growth organizations and companies and so that's what we know and enjoy doing and frankly if we moved slowly I think we would all uh, be a little bit less happy. Um, so, you know, we, we really enjoy that. So then from my standpoint on the profitability side it's incredibly important that you have profitable unit economics and that you understand what your payback periods are, you understand what are the levers that you can continue to pull, and what are the levers that you can pull if you're not profitable as an organization, what are the like overarching levers that you pull to drive towards profitability, um, and then should you need to pull them, you know how. So I think like, those are sort of the frameworks that we think through at Bungalow. Um, and I think it's been really helpful for us. So, and then I think the other kind of piece, candidly, is around uh, your understanding of the capital markets. 
Um, and what does your investor base look like? Um, you know, getting back to different investors will have uh, different incentives. So if you go after a seed or a series A investor or an angel that doesn't have a uh, hundred million dollars or a billion dollar fund behind them, they're probably going to want you to move towards profitability sooner because they don't have the pockets to be able to invest further in you. Now, if you go towards an investor that has a billion dollars in capital, they need to put that billion dollars of capital to work. And so they will actually probably want you to go faster and align towards growth um, because they have the capital put to deploy. So, yeah. Kind of playing off that last question. Yeah. You guys were first conceptualizing the product and then kind of prototyping it. Mm -hmm. How frequently and how often were you guys bringing in the investors to kind of see where you guys were going? What did that feedback look like? Minimally. Um, you know, it's, it's your company, it's your product. Um, I think investors are really helpful to see around corners and pattern match a little bit. Um, but I'm being recorded, so I'll be careful. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, you need to have conviction in what it is that you're trying to do. Um, and then it's, help, it's been really helpful for me to gain our investors' advice around benchmarking to other things that they have seen. Um, and that has helped us, I think, pattern match, anticipate problems, also recognize we're probably a little bit harder on ourselves than we should be, um, but whatever, let's continue to do that. Uh, and um, yeah, so like actually little, um, but it was helpful I think one of the things that was really helpful in the early days from our investors was, uh, you know, pushing pushing us to be uncomfortable, be comfortable with being uncomfortable, um, and having that pattern match of, hey, it might seem like the sky is falling today, but there's always going to be tomorrow, um, and sure enough, there was. So, yeah, in the back. Hey. Oh. Oh. Hi there. Uh, so, with so many companies in this uh, kind of co-living space, yeah. and all of them trying to kind of get that sweet spot of affordability, quality of life, and convenience, what kind of things are you tr doing to differentiate yourself, and uh, what lessons have you learned uh, from initially kind of just matching roommates to now trying to like build th these mini communities? Yeah, so I'll start with the first question, because it aligns closely with the question mm -hmm. we asked earlier around growth, um, and how do you think about growth versus profitability. Um, you know, for us, I think growth is very much a defensive weapon um, because what is better from a defensibility than locking up the best inventory of homes? Uh, and so for us, you know, we have very quickly and about a third of the time uh, of our next largest competitor are now two to three times the size of them. Um, so that that's speed and operational excellence is really important. And then I think to the defensibility standpoint as well, you know, making sure that you have the really tight feedback loops in place so that you are constantly tweaking and iterating on the customer experience to make it better and better and better. And I think the same thing is true for the roommate experience and roommate dynamics. Um, we think about community across a framework of basically three different areas. It's within the household, it's across the homes within market, and it's across bungalow as a whole. Um, and getting that household unit correct is unbelievably important because if you don't get that right, everything else falls apart. Um, and so it's not rocket science, it's, it's talking to your customers and seeing what works well and what doesn't and making sure that you have the processes in place to learn from it. Yep. I'm really interested in the similarities between uh, uh, property rentals and software subscription seems like perhaps <laughs> that's very similar, but I also see that being really risky and getting those models confused. I'm wondering if you have any lessons or insights around that. That is a great question. Um, you know, I think there are some big differences. Uh, Keith talks a lot about real estate is a game where outliers will kill you. Um, and so in software, you know, you have 80% margins, 
doesn't really matter if you have a bad customer, you can just like inject them. For us, we have real investment that we're putting in each one of these homes. There's real capital going to work. And so it's incredibly important that our underwriting and pricing models and demand models are accurate. Um, but then I do think there are a lot of interesting corollaries around how we think about scaling this and how we think about marketplace dynamics and how does that then align with subscription revenue. Um, so I think that there are really strong corollaries and, and where, it's, where it's similar is if you build a phenomenal uh, subscription software business, your retention is excellent. And so for us, we think about it very similarly. And so we're very, very focused right now in particular on an outsized proportion of our uh, development cycle is really geared towards that resident and customer experience um, so that we create an ecosystem and a network where folks want to live with us for five, six, seven, eight years. Um, and then you know, even thinking about, okay, what are other models that we can take after that initial five plus year term that then they'll want to stay within this bungalow ecosystem still. And it gets back down to this idea of what, what are we trying to do? It's let's create a home for everyone. Um, and so there's just obviously a matter of, of focus and how do you think about staging those as you move forward? Maybe you would add? Uh, I think what you said about the margins is, I mean, I had a SaaS company before this and we fired customers. And it, it actually, you had a, like a great feeling afterwards sometimes. <laughs> <It's just> like, <laughs> they were pain and, and in our model, it's way more expensive. Yeah. It's way more expensive. You have to be very thoughtful. And you have to balance going fast against making sure that you are moving supply for us yep. at, a, at a high speed. Yep. So it is, it's very much a challenge. Yeah, I think the other, uh, that's a really interesting point. I think the other really interesting point is, uh, yeah, it's bad if software doesn't work. It's actually conceivably really bad. But if you screw up someone's home, Probably a lot worse. Um, and so it's really important that we get it right. Yeah. So uh, I'm sorry, I'm not that familiar with the business model of, of Bungalow. I'd like to know more about uh, how do you make money. And at the same time, also, I'd like to know like what happens in a city where the price to buy a home, I mean, the mortgage to pay, is actually higher than the market rent. Yeah, so starting out, we've taken a very similar model to how we work started, which is we sign multi-year master leases with homeowners, so we're renting on that side, and then we're essentially subletting out on the resident side. Um, you know, we are able to essentially, through managing our purchasing um, and economies of scale, we're able to create a slight margin spread there, and then... Um, you know, as we scale, that incremental revenue becomes quite a lot. Uh, and so we're essentially making money through that. I think that is sort of V1 of the underlying business model. And there's a lot of work that we're, work threads we're focusing on, on um, where do we expand that outside of just sort of that initial margin spread. And so that's value added services, that is um, you know, a lot of different underlying things that we're doing right now as well that we could conceivably open up to. So um, I'll give like one quick example of what that could look like. Uh, you know, there are a handful of furniture rental companies out there. I don't know if anyone's come across this. Furnish Feather or some others. Um, and they actually couldn't keep up with our SLAs that we needed to have furniture delivery in place. So we had to build our own furniture buying warehousing 3PL and logistics network um, just be able to deploy furniture to our homes quickly enough. Um, and so there is an opportunity for us to become even more world class at that and staff up that team where we could offer it externally. And so that's just one of many, many, many things that we have sort of through our entire org um, that could potentially create new business lines down the road. Probably have time for one last question. Cool. Um, in the back. Um, so, it, your company is really inspiring. 
Um, Thank you. And you've been in contact before contact was a thing. <laughs> before it was a thing. But over the next few years, what do you see as key challenges and opportunities as the industry develops? Um, first and foremost, it is a huge industry, right? Like I think the uh biggest market there is is residential real estate and kind of broader real estate landscape um and it has also been something where because of urbanization because like just the human growth rate has been positive um people have done basically almost nothing and been able to make fortunes in real estate for a very very long time um, and so i think it's one of the reasons and then local knowledge like everyone says location, 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 real estate. It could not be more true. Um, and so local is like highly fragmented as well. And so all of this means is there's this pretty old industry um, that still exists and is still backwards in a lot of ways that has disproportionate amount of profitability, revenue creation, wealth generation. Uh, and so you see prop tech really coming into its own to think about how do we how do we change um, and how do we make improvements through every single facet of this space. Um, I think we're just scratching the surface. Um, it will be really interesting to see what the economy does um, over the next five years and how the global economy in particular uh, impacts this. Um, you know, and I think less so on bungalow and more so I think just prop tech in general. Um, so, I mean, obviously rising interest rate environments, there's a lot of fintech companies in this space. Um, so I, I don't profess to know, I think candidly, we've been super heads down on doing this. So I don't have a huge allocation of time to be able to pick my head up. Um, but I think, you know, we're just scratching the surface um, with seeing what, what technology can really do to, to improve the real estate space in general. So, cool. Thank you all. Yes. And just, uh, just before we wrap up, that uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, Terminal brings global opportunities to technical talent. And so we have a lot of engineering and product roles available right now if you want to check them out. We work with amazing partners like Bungalow who are hiring all across Canada, the U.S. So if you'd like to learn more about Bungalow, you can check out bungalow.com or terminal.io to find out more about those opportunities. Uh, this is a small gift for Duncan McDowell because he's from down the street and I didn't want to send Andrew home with a bunch of things. But uh, you did get a gift. It is in the mail and it's on the way here. <laughs> Andrew's joining us, for those of you that are from San Francisco. And uh, tomorrow he's on multiple stages at Collision. If you'd like to check him out there, um, he'll be on the Growth Stage Summit. He'll be on a couple panels from what I understand. I'll, I'll see you there. Perfect. But one one last time. Thanks, guys. And thanks for coming. Thank you. All right. Cool. So, okay. yeah, if you will be hanging around for just a bit, we're resetting the room. So, uh, if you want to speak to the guys, uh, by all means.